Chris Chameleon, Salma Award-winning singer, composer, and actor, is joining us today. Prolific, endlessly creative, and innovative, you became a music phenomenon as the cross-dressing frontman of band Boo, hmm. which achieved international acclaim and even a cult following worldwide, playing 800 gigs in 17 countries, before embarking on a platinum-selling solo career with albums like Akaralia in 2005 and a simultaneous release of Shine and Seven the Yimmel in 2006. But he's also a gold owner. Chris, welcome to Troy Coast. Thanks, nice to be here. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, we appreciate your time. Um, let's get to it. Pioneering monkey punk, as you called it, with Boo, and launching an album which consists of the poems of Ingrid Jonker, set to music, is unique to say the least. It seems like you walk to the beat of your own drum. What do you say to that? Yes, I did, and I might have um, done better had I not been that way inclined. Uh, every business, every venture in life, especially if it's something that you're making for other people or that you intend selling to other people, requires some level of compromise. And it's not that I didn't want to compromise, it just never occurred to me. And I guess I'm fortunate or blessed, or however one wishes to word that, that it worked out. But I think there are a lot of people who don't compromise and we don't even know them because they, they never get seen. Hmm. Well, you, I think another way of putting it is sort of, sort of there's an aspect of it in, in the term counterculture. Now, Boo, you started in 1997 and uh, you had a massive following even in the Benelux countries, which is uh, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, uh, and even the USA. I think you guys toured uh, almost all the states there. Um, do you think that the, the, the message or the ethos of the band was sort of counterculture? Um, and w why did it resonate um, as well as it did? Yes, again, if it was counterculture, it wasn't so intentionally. But when you look back at it, you can evaluate it and say, well, it was counterculture. Um, and, and it was counterculture not because there was a belief in a certain ideology or a certain way of being. It was counterculture because it was authentic. And the, the kernel of that authenticity happened to be counterculture. So these things are more happenstance. It's not, it's not always plotted. It's not, we're not that clever. <laughs> um, I think there are people that are very clever and who plot things. Uh, and it goes from artists right up to government structures. But um, at least in, in that part of my life and with the whole boo thing, and actually, for most in my in my artistic career, I'd never been very calculated. I'd never been goal orientated. I was, I just did what I felt natural. Yeah. yeah. You once uh, you once told me about the uh, inspiration for um, your, your your creations, your musical creations, uh, and your talents, and it. Uh, it uh, yeah you said it almost it would almost come to you and then it would go to your vocal cords mm. um, I think that that sort of aligns with that authenticity bit and uh, um, I guess the you know I guess um, I guess that it uh, I guess that it resonated with a group of people that saw that authenticity or appreciated that authenticity um, but that's I guess that that organic virality is almost the uh, the, uh, the the wish of every artist or creator in the world. Um, so it is, uh, it's something that we grew up uh, actually seeing and trying to, um, yeah, trying to, it, 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 at the stage where I started listening to me, it was almost a, uh, it, is, it was already at that cult following. So it was sort of easy to, to, to follow, but um, to decipher the authenticity was something that I think later in life one looks back on and, uh, uh, and evaluates or, 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 or sifts through. Yeah, I think um, in, intrigue is also quite a big thing. We live in an age when most of our basic needs are taken care of. Yes. So now, uh, I think a band like Boo wouldn't have gotten anywhere 3,000 years ago when people were just like trying to survive. Yeah. But now that all your basic needs are sort of taken care of and we have a sense of safety and we have enough food, well, mm -hmm. if, if, you're, if you're one of those people, but that actually accounts for the majority of the world population. The, the world has gone forward uh, has progressed a lot in that sense and most people actually do have something to eat do have some shelter it's it can be better for many people but once you've covered those basic needs then you start 
you start um, dabbling in, in intrigue and you allow yourself yes. to be intrigued. And Boo was a quintessentially intriguing band. It was a very strange thing to behold, a cross-dressing front man um, and, and very odd lyrics, uh, mm. but not lyrics that cannot be understood, just the angle that the lyrics take. It, it was more that, that okay. kind of way. And obviously the musical arrangement was very unusual. Okay. So people afford themselves that intrigue and they they go on that journey and they leave thinking like what just happened to me and what did I just expose myself to mm. and and it was a nice vibe I think that was also important not that that's that important because a lot of guys don't have a nice vibe a lot of guys are really unhappy and and sing about wanting to kill themselves and also uh, a lot of people identify with that well, um, well I think at attaining that type of success at such a young age I remember listening to uh, the front man of, of, of Coldplay where he, they asked him about that first album that they came out with and the later the later works and he said well we're just far better musicians now um, you sort of had that success from the start with your, with, with, with Boo was that uh, do you when you look back now are you do you, th do you think you're more uh, uh, how do you look back at the the Chris artist there talent wise or um, how do you compare him to you today there's a reckless abandon that comes with youth uh, okay. which is why the business of music by and large is a young man's a young person's game and um, and your top sellers even though most of the money sits in the higher age classes it's only when people are in their 30s 40s and 50s they really have money so they're the ones who really have the purchasing power for music and yet uh, the music that is sold to the younger generation, you know, teens and in their 20s, that's the music that really sells uh, the most in the world today. And um, there are a lot of other reasons related to people's choices and how they consume uh, and how important what they consume uh, is, is to them. But I think music in many ways is a young man's game because music, the, the creativity and the the reckless abandon mm. and the the rebelliousness that comes with it all um, is at its best when you're young and then what happens is as you get older you um, you become a better musician yeah. but you become less spontaneous you become more calculated and the worst thing that can happen and and this has happened to me it's quite it's quite awful <laughs> the worst thing that can happen is you're um, at some point especially when you make your first platinum selling album you think ah i figured it out i am the master of the universe <laughs> i i know i have found the way yes. and that's probably the biggest the mistake formula. you can make <laughs> because your success was built on the abandon on the uh, authenticity on the spontaneity yeah. and the moment you think you can control it then you make a trite album and everything is is so it's controlled and it just lacks that verve and this is a process that you can speak to any musician that is in his 50s like mm -hmm. i am and it's it's just a process that that people go through musicians go through and then you know when musicians get older they go more into production or yes. they go into music uh, scoring music for movies for example yes. um and it happens to the greatest i mean you think of a, a fantastic artist like Sting, for example. There yeah. was a time when he sold out stadiums, and then the stadiums became arenas, and now it's even smaller. And it's, but but it's okay because he's made his millions and he's got a fabulous life. And it's like, well, that's the way it was. Well, if you, I guess if you talk about the the, the spoils of war, almost as a, as an artist, um, and you mentioned the reckless abandon as a, as a youth, I guess if we talk about uh, ambition on that when you set out to start when you set out and started boo or uh, your musical career uh, what you, did you have sort of a, a grandiose goal um, that you guys wanted to to achieve or was it purely like you said that expression of spontaneity and youth and yeah like humanity? I said earlier I, I never really I've never really been a very goal oriented mm. person I like living in the now and I like I'm whimsical in that way but I think most bands, in, in the f at least the first year that you start playing a musical instrument as a kid, you know, as, or as a young person, um, maybe most bands, their first goal is to be bigger than the Beatles. Yeah. So we're going to take <laughs> the world mania. by storm. We're just going to be like, there's going to be me mania all yeah, over the yeah. show. 
and it takes a few reality checks before uh, you 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 start accepting that that you don't accept that it's not going to happen but the dream sort of fades away and you're on your tra trajectory and you're carrying on and um, and then at some point many years later you reflect and you're like hey what happened to me becoming greater than the Beatles yes. and then you can either go like well that's not how it works or you can become really bitter and be like no it's the music industry and I was I was schneid I was done in <laughs> You get that as well as few things <laughs> as sad as a as a bitter old musician. <laughs> and uh, but an, another way, I think, what happens is if you're by any measure a, a reasonable person, is uh, you reflect and you you understand how the industry works. You understand how people's taste works, work, and you understand how how you are put together, and um, and the the importance of timing. Sorry. You know, some bands um, are at their best before they make it big. Um, I mean, you, you take a band like Midnight Oil. I mean, mm -hmm. some of the viewers might know, might not know the references that I'm using, but that was a band who did really terrific work since the 70s. And then in 1986, they made Diesel and Dust, which was the big album. And yeah. then after that, they sort of lost the plot and it, it was less exciting and people sort of forgotten. And even now when you see midnight oil you'll say hey uh, beds are burning that song and they're like yeah you know that's the one and then you have other bands who get lucky and then they stick with a wave like uh, or get lucky that that's not a good way to put it I don't believe in the concept of get lucky but I'm going right. to use it by because I Time don't want to explain worst. myself yeah okay. so you too for example they yes. were a fairly young band yeah. and they 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 made their breakthrough at a fairly young age but then they stuck with the times and they actually mm. kept nailing it until they forced 500 million people to take their recent yes. album which wasn't a very good one but they really had an extremely good run All right. and then other bands um, go on forever but they don't make any breakthrough and then one day they get this Mm -hmm. this luck shot like the guys mm -hmm. from hey, Macarena oh, yes. yeah, yeah. Which, they were in their 40s overnight. when that happened yeah. yeah it's overnight but that night came after 40 years yes. or oh, who was it oh, leave the girl, is it? Um, what is the name of that The Darkness The Darkness the was darkness, also a yeah, glam yeah. band that had been going Absolutely. since forever and then uh, what was it 15 years ago mm -hmm. so they, they had a, a breakthrough with, with that song that I just tried to sing, which I actually can't remember. I don't know why it just popped into my head. Was it I Believe in a Thing Called Love? That one? Was that the Thank you very much. That's that exactly it. it. Yeah. You're obviously sharper than I <laughs> Okay. Um, but so that evolution of an artist or growth of an artist, um, I guess it's also shaped with experiences. Uh, I think if you've traveled the amount of countries that you have with, with, with your performances, um, there's a element of... Uh, or, yeah, let me start again. Mm. That's a very interesting observation. It's true. I hadn't thought of that. But mm -hmm. your 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 creativity originates from life experiences yes. in, in for for a large part, not entirely, but for a large part. And the more life experiences you gather or pick up, the more you have something to report. The challenge, I think, is to be honest about that because what happens is people, very often as they get older, they become more reserved. Mm -hmm. They understand the impact of their words. They also understand that, you know, I believed that and now I, it seems I was wrong. And Whereas when you're young, it's like, I'm right. I know everything and this is the way it is and I'm just going to say something and I don't care about the consequences, which is a great thing for art. Yes. But um, so again, as, as you age in your craft, mm -hmm you do acquire more life experiences that is if you allow yourself to live recklessly enough a lot of people are too risk averse to to go for that yes. uh, i've won like exposing myself to yes. new dangers and and then the challenge is having the experience is one thing but the challenge is being honest about that experience okay. what do you have to say do you still have something to say and if that which you have to say is like risk averse and trying to mm. you know word it in such a way that um I don't want to offend anybody and then you know, you're going to lose the plot. You still have to have a, a, a certain degree of abandon and certainly honesty because honesty equals authenticity. But surely, okay, but if we talk about experiences shaping um, almost your, your career, your growth, evolution as an artist, you, you have to consider that these experiences all, all also shape your personal views in life, right? So mm -hmm. you were born in 1971 in, in Johannesburg. Uh, you 
your career, you mean, I guess uh, growing up, you lived through an apartheid uh, era, but you started your career um, in, the, in post-94 South Africa. With Boo, I think, was 1997. No, no, not, career really, was not really. I have to correct you. I, All right. I, my first professional gig was in 1989. 1989? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because before Boo, there was... Well, like all young bands, you start with all sorts of other things. The, the name of my first band was, because we were inspired by the old Fool Frey movement, so yes. it was actually okay. Afrikaans. Okay. And then I discovered that the thing about uh, Afrikaans, the Afrikaans and Hebrew, if you mm -hmm. rock in them, it sounds like you're choking in broccoli. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> uh, it just didn't work for me, and then I swung to English. But when we, my first band, an Afrikaans band, was called Chris Clinton Forbes Fabric. Wow. Yeah, maybe, maybe look. Everybody, everybody knows the the boo and your solo career. Maybe if you just give us a a, 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 a quick summary on your your sort of your early early experiences in the, the first band. Those are the those are the things that craft a musician, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's it's a story that's not always told. Well, you can imagine that the audience is not very big for a band called Chris Clinton <laughs> for and Fabric, but uh, that's what we were into, so we went for that. And then we merged with the Flea and the Pirings who um, actually had a bit of a profile and then um, and we became the Flea and the Pirings. I was actually assimilated wow. by that band. And then we started making more English language music and then we had a very trite uh, name. It was Fuel. It was Fuel. the name of the name, but it stood for Facades Under Euphoria Law. <laughs> Did you come up with that? No. <laughs> of course. Okay, of course. Yeah. Um, I'm ashamed to say. <laughs> and um, and then then came the band that really had the biggest profile uh, mm -hmm. of the all, all the bands I had before Boo, and that was Blue Chameleon. And Blue Chameleon, okay. because we did have a record deal with uh, Tusk Records back in the day, and I think they subsequently became Gallo or EMI, I think it was Gallo. And um, uh, and and made a nice recording, and that was a wonderful band, which which did very well. But it was a very eclectic sound, and mm -hmm. and that was in you know the early '90s in South Africa. It was very difficult to be an original musician. The only way to really make a living as a musician was to be a cover band. Right. Occasionally, someone would break through with something original, like Avoid did mm -hmm. in the '80s, and then Petit Cheval had a, a brief shot at it, you know, and. Right. And then, and then in the '90s, um, well, actually, already in the '80s, Mango Groove, the crossover mm -hmm. thing started happening with Jaluka mm -hmm. and Mango Groove. O already, we had a sense of um, the value of crossover and uh, the One Nation concept. Yes. But that's not something you can force. Johnny Clegg was a guy who yeah. who, who spoke Zulu very well. Yeah. He understood the Zulu culture. Yeah, he loved uh, his music. Or exactly. He, vice versa. So he was authentic. Yeah. And um, and uh, the girl from Mango Groove, oh my goodness, what was her name? Lovely lady. Oh, um, shucks. Yeah, I want we're, to say Michelle or something, but... We're going to get it at the end of the podcast. We're going to get it right, okay. <laughs> and, um, and she didn't pretend to be like, oh, I'm all like a multi-culti South Africa, I see Zulu. Yeah. No, she was just herself, but she the band consisted of a, a wonderful cross-section mix of South African... Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, cultures and yeah. individuals who then produced that that lovely Almost sound spontaneously so. because of the mix up yeah. all, the, all the ingredients of the, of the mix but yeah. you, you mentioned that you got your inspiration from the full frame movement I know I mean um, the the way I think you, you, you said the, fir the first band was in 1989 which was the year of the full freight tour around the country right, right? In, right. in the midst of uh, uh, yeah, in the, in, the, in the midst of a uh, very traditional Afrikaner apartheid regime, you had uh, what is it, Andre Latois, which is now Quest Com Quest Com Base, and then Johannes Kerkel, obviously as youngsters, um, and a lot of others. There was uh, U.S. Tompel Duis and Eduard Strakers, and there was Kuis, really? okay, uh, which was Marcel van Heeren, which is a, a well-known South African Afrikaans actor, wow. and that was very interesting stuff they did. I I filmed something with Tashis Mankis, the actor, yes. the other day, yes. and with Kuis he did a song. I think it was with Quest, uh, Cowboy Betty Driving, which is one of his poems, which is okay. also a lovely piece of work. But they were they were sort of um, okay, well, I think from 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 looking back at that, I mean, it was sort of, sort of almost a delayed um, Beatlemania that hit South Africa. <laughs> Extremely delayed because yeah. in the eighties we were making music, rocking in Afrikaans for the first time. But the basics of that rock, when you listen to mm -hmm. the the Johannes Kerkel music, it really is like fifties music. Yes. Amped a bit. It, it's <laughs> musically, sorry to say, it wasn't very original. Yeah. 
but Afrikaners were so far behind yes. um, in in their freedom of expression and relating to the global mm. um, contemporary sound yes. that it struck us as something really new. Something really new. But why was it inspirational for you? Why? I mean, at, at the time, I guess there's a there is that element of uh, you know there was obviously a youthful movement and people questioning the the common narrative that was in the country and uh, very a very you know very centralized sort of narrative but why was it uh, why was it inspiring for you and, and did it was it something that um you knew was sort of happening on a grassroots level and it influenced what you wanted to do or um yeah i, I guess open canvas I, I, when you said inspired you i, lo- I love the question and um <clears throat> the answer considering the answer reveals how pervasive oppression can be because you live in a you know i grew up in a system i I, I started going to school in the 1970s and um you live in a system that is so oppressive uh to a degree physically but especially mentally and principally and and you feel there's something about this that that's not lacquer with you and and the weird thing is the one of the great justifications one of the major uh, justifications for apartheid was to keep communism at bay yes. but in so doing it imposed on its population many of the same hmm. uh, structures of oppression that was imp- that were employed in the communist countries yes yeah. and then and what was really nice is amidst this very pervasive oppression mm-hmm. s- the, the 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 spark of resistance had been lit it was always there actually it didn't start with the full fray but it the ball the ball started rolling yes. with full fray it was just a little turd rolling down <laughs> a hill you know for a long time and then gathered you know a bit yeah. here and a bit there and then it became bigger and full fray was really when it was oh i can actually see there's a ball of shit coming my way right. excuse my language and um of course, 10 years ago, it wouldn't occur to me to yeah. excuse my language, but I've now become a father, so I kind of try <laughs> to watch my language. Um, You're going to try and get the uh, the the, uh, the brashness out of you a little bit in the interview. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Turn yeah. back the clock. Yeah. And um, and so, and, and I think that's what happened. And, and then finally, we were like, this is the question now. Uh, in the late 80s, I was actively participating with the ANC which was at the time a band organization and meeting mm. in ba- it was terribly exciting meeting in basements in Johannesburg and in park underground parking garages yeah. meeting and discussing the overthrow of the regime and we had these contact groups because it's very hard for youngsters today to understand that as a white person or uh, in living in the suburbs in Johannesburg yes. you an Afrikaner yeah, time, yeah you didn't even get to meet young black people oh. You saw only old black people, you know, mm. gardeners and housemaids, mm. and then some people work, walk, working in the streets. But actually, a youthful person, you wouldn't even see them. So it was a very, it's like, hey, wow, isn't it? Yeah. Hair, like, wow, what, what sort of creature is this? And yeah. and maybe it was reciprocal, reciprocal. I, I, I would presume so. And I'm, and I remember many of the experiences were that yes, it's, it's the same from the other side. But it's, but it's almost, it's almost akin to. Um, you know, going walking across the trenches and meeting uh, meeting their enemy and realizing, all right, well, the similarity between us is yeah, exactly. quite massive. Yeah, right? you, is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're human, it's yeah. exactly like me. Yeah, and um, so I was very active in that. And for example, in uh, one of my favorite little stories is in 1987. Yes. I I wrote on my school desk. Now I I grew up as uh, the hardwood. The high school, school I, yeah, yeah, yeah. The high school I went to was Wurzkwa Linden. Yes. Now, to give you a background of the school, who was in Wurzkwa Linden was Kor Dirks, the scriber from the Eile Reeks. A lot of people okay. won't know that, but Afrikaners <laughs> will know what I'm talking about. Then there was Rian Kreibach. Yes. He's, he was uh, from uh, Wurzkwa Linden. And then there was um, uh, Karen Zoid was in Wurzkwa okay. Linden. Elvis Blue was in Wurzkwa Linden. Wow. Um, Andre Schwartz. Andre Schwartz was in Wurzkwa yeah. Linden. But also in Wurzkwa Linden were Hein Groskopf, who in 1986 planted mm-hmm. a bomb in Krugersdorp for the ANC that killed ah, four people. Hein Groskopf okay. was there. And uh, Andre Stander, the bank robber. Yeah. Really? So all these people said so th- there is something in the water. There's something in the water. There. Absolutely. <laughs> I was about to say. Yeah. And, um, but so in 1987, I wrote Free Mandela on my desk because yeah. I sat 
at a desk and there on the desk was scribbled small RV beer and mm -hmm. Foki Coffers was mm -hmm. written there and I was just like hmm. nah. yeah. Free Mandela. And they came and they found me and I got severely punished for it. They didn't expel me because they didn't want to a attract more attention to the school because just the previous year, year one of the the old school uh, pupils, uh, Ein Groskop, yes. planted this bomb. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the, for me personally, the ramifications were really huge. And because um, most people didn't even know what Man who Mandela was, but the yes. principal did. Most of the kids, they had absolutely no idea. There was this guy and it was like, Mandela, I don't know. And so that seed of rebelliousness was yes. always there. Yeah. But full phrase sort of, it always takes one guy, one group or yeah. of people to stand up and it gives the other people yeah. courage. Okay, we were somewhat younger, but then yes. we got on the same vibe. But did you did you feel you could um, start expressing yourself? I mean, you're, you're, you're a composer and you... Uh, yeah, I, I know that you wrote the songs for obviously for Boo. You were the, you were the, um, um, would the lyrics that you wrote. Did you feel you could now write whatever you wanted when you saw Full Frey, you know, re reach what they did or get 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 the word out of a, almost a uh, I wouldn't say populism, but almost a popular resistance that you could express yourself how you felt you wanted to. Um, or were you always just, this is what I believe, this is my authentic, uh, um, you know, this is what I'm going to say because it's authentic. So you didn't, you, you didn't feel that you were held back in any sense uh, up until that point? I didn't. Mm -hmm. And that's a shame. And, and what is really interesting about that, again, it shows you how pervasive oppression can be. Because you, I never, although I was politically active as a teenager mm. it never occurred to me to express that in music it wasn't really an option interesting it was when Fulfred did it i was like hey it can actually that i can yeah. do that as well but it didn't even occur to me and and i'm afraid we live in times when we're actually pretty much back to that it's it's quite it's shocking definitely come full circle yeah it has come full circle it's really it's it's somewhat disconcerting but um it's just then someone stands up and does it and it gives you the courage on the one hand but it, the courage wasn't necessarily lacking because as i said we, we had always been involved uh, in in that sort of yeah. uh, nefarious rebellious activity yes, yes. overthrowing the state but um the license and 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 the trail was blazed you know well we um i think the uh when you mentioned you were politically active um uh, even as a youngster or in, um, in your teenage years as well and it was it was very much down the line of on the line of you know civil liberties and personal freedom i don't know if a lot of people actually know um how you know how you are uh yeah, i mean i guess you have a you have a you have a very big twitter following that sort of that can you, you can follow you on Twitter and you realize that declining daily but still fairly <laughs> when you follow you on Twitter and you look at what you've said you, pe people don't realize how almost staunch uh, I wouldn't say it, well let, let me say a, a protagonist for freedom and civil liberties and personal freedom right mm. um, and we're actually I mean we're sitting here in the free state on your farm mm. um, but how do you then how do you I, I guess the 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 question is it, it it wasn't you weren't campaigning or actively or active in the political scene in that stage on the on the freedom side because it was something that was uh, counter to the narrative. It was actually it, it, or pure curiosity. It was actually your basis sort of belief set around, I guess, freedom um, or the ideals of freedom and people. Um, so uh, I guess the, the point I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to get to is that you have a you know, you have a love for freedom, um, mm. as, as, as I understand it. Well, how would you define that? And, and why was that something that you understood almost innately from a young age? And you were active in it, like you said, even separate from your music, um, even, even apart from the, uh, the, you know, saying what you want to and cross-dressing and uh, mm. going where you want to. Um, why was that, why, why that, that innate uh, belief um, or uh, proponent of uh, personal freedom I grew up um, uh, in a single parent family in a small flat in Johannesburg 
and the confines of those walls obviously frustrated me. The good thing was it developed my, or, or it, it probably created an environment for my imagination to be developed because you can't physically escape the wall, so you do so yes. uh, in, your, in your mind. Um, but I'd, I'd always felt a, a sense of severe restriction. And now I live on a farm, mm. and, and I think it was always innate that I needed to be able to move, to breathe freely and to move around freely. So I think some of it started there. And then I, I went to boarding school at some point. It was uh, too hard for my mom to keep us at, in a school in Joburg because we were those kids that walked around yeah. with keys around the neck, you know. Okay, but yeah, you're, yeah. you're doing so <laughs> age eight years old, you know. And then she sent us off to boarding school, and that was pretty limiting. I, I mm. remember not feeling free. A t- but, touch of oppression. Yeah. yeah. But I think much of it is rooted in an inherent, um, gosh, you know, it, it, it borders on arrogance, I suppose. Okay. In the sense that, and, and although I would not have worded it as such as a child, I did feel that. Yeah. That I'd never met, and now that I'm 50, I've never met anyone mm-hmm. fit to govern me. Yes. It's as simple as that. I'm not casting any aspersions over your ability to govern. Yes. I all I'm saying is I just I've never met anyone mm-hmm. fit to govern me. And I, I might add to that I've never met anyone I am fit to govern. That's the, yeah the corollary is also mm. equally important. I think that that element of um, you know you can do what you want as long as you don't impose this against somebody else's. Uh, abilities to, uh, to freely act as long as they don't impose on your rights to do that. Right? Yes. I think the sort of the base base tenet of uh, of uh, classical liberal thought, if you can call it that. Um, also, I've I've a, I've a, a great confidence in my own goodness, my own yes. um, well-meaning nature, and in humanity in general. I think I I'm and I I don't think I'm an idealist. I I've seen with my own eyes. I do believe that humans are innately good they go for what is innately good the thing is they're very easily seduced out of that nature yes the fruits in the garden of eden are hanging low they're big and they're juicy and they're ripe for the picking and and this is what goes wrong in the world so often is that the good nature of humans can so easily be corrupted and many people draw from that mm. the conclusion that people are evil people are actually just bad people mm. are the problem it's not that way people truly are good yeah. and it's easy it's as easy as it is to corrupt people yeah. as easy is it to um to draw that goodness to kindle that goodness, that goodness. to to right. inspire that goodness in people it can be done the only the only problem is, and this is a universal problem, and I don't mean universal. I mean universal literally in the scientific way. Yes. We live in a catabolic universe. The universe is breaking down. Stars are burning out. Mm-hmm. Planets are eroding. And the laws of entropy, which mm-hmm. is one of the basic laws of physics, mm-hmm. um, determine that everything's going to burn out and become dead and nothing. And then if there's enough gravity, uh, you know, enough matter in the universe, yes. it'll all pull together and we have a recurring you know, Big Bang Universe, it or again. it'll just be a grey dead zone of nothing. But yeah. because everything in the universe is breaking down, it's easier to break down because you're going with the natural tendency of the universe. Okay. Like this light behind me, I can break it in 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 an instant, mm-hmm. but to fix it, you know, it costs yes. money. I have to earn the money and then I have to go to town. And you know, we live 60 kilometers from yes. town here. <laughs> I have to go to town and get a new bulb and then I have to yeah. fix the whole thing. So to break is a lot easier than to build simply because breaking is in the flow of the universal yes. tendency and the only thing that can counter that universal catabolic tendency mm. is life creation yeah. life does that sometimes the universe i mean stars are born in galaxies far away we see that but it's a phase it's not a principle it's a phase yes. whereas with life Anabolism yes. is a principle. Principle, but it's it's almost sort of 
the process of creation or, or, or creation expansion animalism is a process where you know anything that is destructive is almost sort of uh, incidents and, and these incidents are frequent and automatic and continuous um, the or at least you know um, we, I think that's the, uh, the I guess the, the that that contrast in the ease of destruction but the difficulty in building something or creating something that can expand and grow mm. right and I think we see that in our in our lives and political systems um, I think uh, you know we talked about uh, our country and and, and, and post 90 pre 94 pre 94 post 94 um, there is an element there that uh, you know, you, you talk about science. I mean, there's a, the, the question I want to ask um, is a bit of a technical one in the sense that the if it was the dictionary, and you have a big command of the English and Afrikaans language, uh, almost a woordesmuis, uh, as we can call it in Afrikaans, but uh, of a to, of a word to have an hour. But um, if I went to the dictionary of Chris Communion and I said, define freedom for me, what would you say? Hmm. It could, yeah, it could be a a, a short, pretty um, statement. It could be long, however you. Well, I mean, I I like wearing the cap of the absolutist. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Uh, I tend to refrain from hyperboles, but I yes. like the cap of the absolute, and and then I would say. You're asking me to define freedom, which is not, which already limits freedom. Mm. So freedom in in the dictionary, in my dictionary, would be freedom is not to be defined. Uh, <laughs> I know it's a, I it's knew, an escape. I knew we were going to get a good answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's an escape. <laughs> but the moment you're defining it, it's like, yep. okay, there we go. Um, Very interesting. Totalitarianism. Okay, is it a threat today? Absolutely. Uh, are we seeing 1984 incoming or will life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness survive? Uh, the one thing we must understand is that humanity moves in epochs much larger than the span of a human life. Okay. So my mom, who is still alive today and very well thinking and mm. very able, but she was born... Um, before the Second World War. So she lived through the Second World War and the Vietnam War and the Korean War before that and the first landing on the moon and she saw the arrival of apartheid because she was um, she was 11 years old when the National wow. Party was voted for the first time she uh, was voted in. She was 20... 19? 48. 51? Okay, 48. 48 yeah. okay. And she was she must have been around 24 years old when South Africa became a republic mm-hmm. um, in the Fervurdian times yeah. and so it she lived through yeah 61 61 okay. so she lived through all of that mm-hmm. and now she's still seeing changes happening she saw the, the you know the coming of computers and you know the coming of the fax before that and <laughs> the pager God, she that. saw the arrival of tape, <laughs> tape, for goodness sake. I mean, she grew up with vinyl, but she saw tape arrive, and now we're even way beyond CDs yeah. and MP3s. So, um, and, and But that's a lot of things that happen in, in the space of human life, but still communism predates the arrival of communism, mm-hmm. uh, predates her by a few decades, her birth mm-hmm. by a few decades. And... Um, so that's the first thing is, yes, th- there's always good news, but the bad news is that the good news might not be in your lifetime. Yeah. And as far as totalitarianism is concerned, uh, I, I do have grave concerns regarding freedom and, um, and the rise of totalitarianism in the world today because I think in 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell, I was in the trick, mm-hmm. when the Berlin Wall fell, the... The West had won the war. The East had lost the war, but the East had won the ideology. Because what has happened is that all the, the fundamentals of uh, the communist totalitarian state... Now, the two mustn't be confused, because communism mm-hmm. is not a political system. It's an economic system. Mm-hmm. 
And a lot of people battle with that. Communism is actually a fantastic system. It's really great. The problem is it's too great for the fallibility of humans. It, yes. it leaves itself open to exploitation, and it's been proven that it's always going yeah, to be we've exploited. We've had a few good practical examples in all exactly. history. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, um, so what is happening is that uh, the Western... I'm going to speak from the Western paradigm because I find myself in that paradigm living mm. at the moment, even though I live in Africa. Mm -hmm. Um, has assumed and has assimilated so many of the basic tenets of communism that it's mm -hmm. frightening. And now people are, the, the swing to the left, people often battle with, you know, what's left and right. Yeah. And we know that right has by and large been vilified. Yeah. If you stand up, you say, yes, I'm right wing. It's like, oh, yes. no, 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 not cool. And if you stand up, you say, no, I'm left. And it's like, oh, that's mm -hmm. cool. Now, that already is not in a good balance. The whole yeah. It's tilted in favor of left. But... The two are just different, but uh, a lot of people don't understand that they've, they've been taught that right-wing, that they've been led to believe, rather, that right-wing means uh, you're a racist and you're, um, and, and you're backwards, you know, and you're, you're anti-progressivism, you know. But the way it works is, to put it simply, mm -hmm. left politics means more government. That's what you need to 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 bring the the leftist ideal to fruition. It needs more government because more health care, government health care. We need the government to take care of our health. Yeah. Uh, more uh, welfare. We need the government yes, to take care of our wealth. Yeah. yeah, which means we have to work harder and pay tax for them. Mm -hmm. um, and and what has happened now is. When I was a teenager in the 80s, the thing was fight the system. Mm -hmm. I find, yes, and I must be careful because this is the point at which you sound too much like an old topic. <laughs> but I find that the youths of today are going with the system. Yes. The youths of today are saying, like now in the time of COVID, no, wear your yes. mask. It's right yeah. to wear the mask. And the youths of today are, uh, not all of them, obviously mm -hmm. not all of them, but I'm talking about the mainstream tendency. Yes. And the mainstream tendency is um, is to, yes, we need more welfare. We need to take care of everybody. Yes. It's like, dude, what you don't understand, and I understand that you don't understand that because you're young and you're not earning that money. Yes. But w how do you think you're going to take care of everybody? Mm. It's your money. You're going to have to work yeah. for it, and then you're going to have to redistribute it. And that is a very nice thing to do, actually. It's, it's a good altruist way yes, to do it yeah, but how much of your money are you willing to give away and how much of your space are you willing to give away yes. and do you and this most importantly do you realize that as you give away these things to people for free you're mm -hmm. disincentivizing them yes. you're disabling them from getting yes. that from themselves because I've learned some very expensive lessons in my life because I grew up poor relatively poor and um, and I spent most of my career as a poor, struggling musician. And then suddenly, platinum album. Yes. Money. Life, Jeez, life changes. Silly money. Gosh, man, there were those 500,000 rand a month. Yes. Months, you know, it's just like, yeah, it's rocking a... <laughs> out. This is big. And then what do you want to do? Yeah. You want to help all your friends and family. It's just like, yes, all the friends, you know, it's like, yes. his business, he's, I, <laughs> I invested. In so many businesses and uh, all friends related, because I wanted, uh -huh. I wanted them to yes, also be absolutely. as fortunate as I was, yeah. and what I did was I very successfully re-impoverished myself, and um, and I'm sad to say that not a single one mm -hmm. of those ventures mm -hmm. became a success. Literally, not a single one. Now it could just be luck of the draw, but that's what happened, and I'm talking millions that were wasted and the reason is I did make it too easy for them okay. my friend who wanted a 1.2 million rand loan mm -hmm. for his business mm -hmm. he should have worked harder okay. he should have tried harder life should have made it harder for him so that he could earn it yes. but the next moment he asked his friend and his friend was like man I want you to be be like me yes. be happy and like money 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 <laughs> And share, share the spoils. Yes, and then yeah. he got the money, but it was, it was too easily gained. 
and see. things that are too easy, easily gained are too easily lost. It's too easily lost, absolutely. And it doesn't just work like that in interpersonal relationships. Mm. I mean, of course, I don't hold it against, I hold it against myself, I have to tell <laughs> But it, it, um, it also holds for societies and for governments in general. You should work yes. on empowering people to yes. get things for themselves. You yeah. should not give things away for free. It's not a good way to go. I think it's that it's almost how um, uh, and Ian Rand introduced, you know, the, the individualism to the world, and that finally is that how you pronounce the name? Because I only ever read it, and I'm really? like Ian. What is Ian? Ian. Yeah, Ian. Okay, thanks. Actually, good, I, I think that's the way it goes. I, what, I mean, I did you hear someone say it? Or? That's how the Americans uh, say it. Say it when I was there. Uh, well, then like, it's probably not the way. No, it is. It's probably, it's probably <laughs> not the way. But okay, I, cool. I, I like the fact that. Um, um, you know the the, the 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 strong ideas of individualism, uh, and even if you look at Margaret Thatcher coming in and uh, in the UK and, and and sorting out this collectivist union, uh, th- thought how how two strong women came in and uh, wasn't she the one who said socialism? The problem with socialism is eventually yeah. you run out of other people's money. Yeah, exactly right. Uh. That po- pooling that capital, and I think it's it's almost a um, uh, I guess that 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 acceptance of responsibility by people as individuals mm-hmm. it's very easy like you said to 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 sell them because of their good nature the idea that there is a free lunch that you know that capital custodianship um, can be easy you know you don't you know um, uh, it's easily it, it's easily gotten resources are easily gotten um, and you you know if you Give me a vote, then I will take care of a lot of your responsibilities for you. I love but the way how, you put that, selling people free lunch. Free, free lunch, it's, right? it's obviously an, an, an oxymoron. It's, it is. But, right? but that's the easiest sell you're going to make, is selling it's, something for free. It's a very easy sell. Um, and I think that that is, that is what, uh, just to tie back to what you're talking about um, in terms of the, the popular narrative now, I think there was a strong ethos of individual... Um, uh, individualism and individual responsibility and the acceptance of responsibility that we saw in prosperous periods in history mm-hmm. and it was, it was almost that when the world was uh, you know sort of steering towards collectivism and the welfare state you had the grassroots um, uh, uprising of you know give us back our freedoms I think Elon Musk said the other day you know give people back their goddamn freedoms right um, and that's almost what was popular. I mean, especially with I was, when I was growing up, and you know what, uh, I look at uh, you know the era before, um, before me, where I talked about full free, etc. These uprisings were give me back my freedom. It was freedom oriented um, against oppression. You know, it was, you know, it's binary. Either either you're you're, you're for it or, or against it. And um, what we are seeing today is very much a alarmingly a uh, a popular narrative which is woke almost. You know. It's, it's, it's the collective system, the nanny state system um, can work and should work. It's just we haven't tried it. We haven't tweaked the knobs well enough. You know, uh, communism was, 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 wasn't r- correctly or social wasn't correctly implemented. Uh, but now in a technological age, uh, you mm-hmm. know, we will, we will uh, own nothing, but we will be happy. Mm-hmm. And that's alarming. And I think that's why, hence the question around totalitarianism. And I hope that, uh, uh, I do hope that, that um, the small, if I look at history, uh, you don't need the masses to turn. Uh, you need a few people, you need a small minority of the populace to bring a message of freedom and hope and to do their bit. And mm. then I do think it spreads like wildfire. So uh, I hope it, uh, it happens in our lifetimes where we can, uh, where we can once again see the, the threat of totalitarianism sort of being beaten back. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, I agree with you that today we're seeing a lot of the, a lot, a lot of the signs that aren't, um, aren't very, uh, aren't very promising for individual freedoms. You know, the free lunch mm-hmm. that has been sold so successfully was not a good diet, mm-hmm. and so what it did was it weakened the consumers of that lunch, uh-huh. and. What it was in, in I think Spider Man. It was in Spider Man. Whatever you know, with with great power comes it's great responsibility. responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's not true. Because the most powerful mm-hmm. individuals throughout history, mm. uh, more frequently, 
unfortunately, did not have a great sense of responsibility. Absolutely, yeah. But um, then, then it's almost that they didn't need to necessarily. They didn't need to. They With great power. power comes no need for responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, so, so that's part of the diet. That like um, little tidbits of supposed truth that are sold in mainstream media and in mm -hmm. popular culture mm -hmm. and mainstream culture like that. Then people hear it and they're like, wow, that's so profound, you know, with great power comes great. No, it's not true. It's a moralistic view, but it's not um, realistic. Yes, absolutely. It, it doesn't. You know what comes with great responsibility? Yeah. Great freedom. Great freedom. With great absolutely. freedom comes great responsibility. But mm. that require, great responsibility requires a backbone, and it requires standing up, and it requires uh, a pair. Yeah. You need to be strong, you know, you got a proverbial like, pair. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. Well, absolutely because my <laughs> wife has a bigger pair than I do. <laughs> and um and so so basically the uh, with 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 great um freedom comes great responsibility, but you need a backbone for that. But mm. when you've been weakened yeah. by culture, when you've yes. been weakened literally by diet, when you've been weakened by lies, because the thing about a lie is when you sell someone a lie, when they believe it, they are immediately weaker. Yes. You, th there's something about the truth that makes you very strong. Mm. Um, there's a wonderful book, The Territorial Imperative, written by Robert Ardre. Okay. And I like the book because he starts by uh, this whole paying tribute to Eugene Marais, mm -hmm. the South oh, African yes. writer, because Eugene yeah. Marais was also... Uh, a naturalist. He yes. he wrote yeah. books on the behavior of Which baboons, baboons and ants. behavior of ants, yes. which yes. had international in zoological yeah. ramifications. And yes. But in it, he proved that an animal one third the size of its opponent can mm -hmm. successfully defend his territory if he is on his territory. Wow. And and uh, what was it Lao Tzu yeah. in the Art of Lao War Tzu. said the same Sun thing. Tzu. Yeah, Sun, yes. Sun, Sun, yeah. Sun Tzu said um, uh, fight on your own territory right, yeah, that yeah. way you're strong because then you're right this yes. is your place you're right you're stronger yes. and there and there are many more proofs that the one who is right you might not know who's right and who's wrong but the stronger one is going to show you it's not might is right right is might it's actually how it works but people get told this might is right it's the same as with great power uh, yeah. power comes great responsibility but uh, I'm, I, I digress. The point I'm trying to make is that the responsibility which um, is required mm -hmm. for great freedom um, takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of backbone, it takes a lot of courage. Mm -hmm. And when you've weakened a population, mm -hmm. then they are not interested in that freedom because they're like, uh -huh. does it mean I have to get up and work now? Yeah. Uh, I'd rather just sit here and have True. have stuff. And and so my concern for the future for the Orwellian 1984 future mm -hmm. is that people will be reduced to a consumer and a voter. Yes. The machine will your machine will do all the work and mm -hmm. your machine will pay um the bills and maybe one day your machine will upgrade to a better mus uh, machine so you have more money, but mm -hmm. you're going to sit at home and consume. You're going to eat, watch TV, Get lost in pornography, yeah. and and vote because that's really your value, and I'm worried about that. Um, although, although that kernel mm -hmm. of that core of goodness and appreciation for freedom mm. has, at the strangest times in in the history of mankind, lit a little fire. Yeah. And it's like that line, you can blow out a candle, but you can't blow out a fire. If just enough of those candles burn, it becomes a fire. And then when you blow it, you just blow it higher. Absolutely. You cause the felt brunt to really yeah. spread. 